you know Cleveland, man. It's a disaster weather-wise. Oh yeah. Yeah, the fucking blizzards. It's cold. I, I'm and it's like it's bleak. It was snowing yesterday. Mm-hmm. And I knew I had to do the interview today, but I was like, I'm just feeling down. Like just really like this is just. I'm ready for the sun to come Pump out. Up, kind man. of stuff, right? Ready to get. So last night at midnight, I can't make it to a melt. But the first thing I'm thinking about, like, what do I need to, like, just, I want to feel good. I want to feel comfort. I literally, I'm like, I'm going to make a grilled cheese. Good so, man. So I go, and, and I'm sitting there, ba- real minimalist stuff, real basic stuff. And, but, That's where what, it starts. That's but what is that? But seriously, start. in all seriousness, what is that about? Like, what's the, what is it with grilled cheese? I know it's a comfort food, but from a nostalgic perspective, from, there, there's, like, an emotional oh. thing that happens there, right? Yeah, we found that out. I mean, that... I, I touched on that unintentionally when I opened Melt. Like, I, grilled cheese has always been huge, a huge, like, meal staple for me since I was a kid. It was the first thing that my mom let me make as a kid, so that's kind of where I got the niche to cook, and I, I kind of built off of the grilled cheese sandwich, yeah. you know, in my own kitchen with my mom when I was a kid. I took it into my high school years, my college years, my adult years. It, I'm, the, I'm the guy that was always on the go. Like, I was never sitting down to eat a meal. If I sat down in my 20s to eat a meal, it was extremely rare. Were you just busy? Were you yeah, like- I was busy. I was playing music in bands. I was working in restaurants. I was probably dating four girls at the same time. I was doing too much rock stuff. And roll. Yeah. So I was grabbing stuff. I was making a quick sandwich, and I was taking it in the car to wherever the hell I was going next. So bread and cheese was always like a major staple of my yeah. diet. And I was always working in different restaurants at the time. And no matter how good the food is in our, any restaurant you work in, you always get sick of it. So you always find things to make. You with, go back to basics? Kind yeah, of thing? with the yeah. ingredients that are in the restaurant. So I was always gravitating towards really good bread in a restaurant, really good cheese, and a couple different ingredients. I was throwing it together, and I would take it home, watch late-night television, get up, do it the next day. Yeah. You know, so that's really where the idea for Melt came from for me was the fact that, like, I could do so much, so many things with this grilled cheese sandwich, but I was making this grilled cheese for myself, but then the staff that I, of any restaurant I was always working in would see me making these grilled cheese sandwiches, and they're like, hey, man, that looks really good. Why don't you make me one? Make me one. So I ended up making like four, five, six, seven, eight grilled cheese sandwiches a night for the staff. Like different variations? Yeah, different variations, or sometimes I'd make one. You know, I'd make the same one, or, you know, I was just kind of playing with it yeah. back, back in the early days. But I never thought, like, oh, my God, there's a restaurant behind this. But it goes back to what your question you are asking me is, like, after I've opened Melt, I find that, like, Everybody has a story about a grilled cheese. Like somehow, some way, everybody can remember. Like it was the first thing my mom made for me, my dad, my grandfather, my grandma, my little brother. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm one of six and my older brother made this for me when, when we got home from school. Or it's just such a nostalgic, like emotional trigger for people. Is, it a, mid- met- is it a Midwestern thing, do you think? No. Is it a, is it a, I, no, a, we a get nationwide people in from thing? England. We get people in from Germany. We get people in from Europe all the time. They're like, we can't wait to go to Melt because it's yeah. something, you know, and there's... But so, what about grilled cheese? Like, ah, I mean, wh- why not? Why not? Like, because it's like very, sushi. You know what I'm saying? You're, I mean, I'm not saying that people don't have right. these wonderful experiences g- eating great sushi, but there I, isn't this sense of like, man, I remember. I think it's the simplicity of it because everybody can wrap their head around two slices of bread and cheese, and yeah. and in some sort of way, it's being toasted. You know, whether it's in a frying pan or whatever the fat component you're using on there, or different flavors. Yeah. I'm the, you know, I like tomatoes. I like pickles on mine. I like mine dipped in ketchup. Or I like it very plain or, you know, so I haven't, I mean, we've served millions of people since we've opened up and I have not met one person who has walked in the front door and like put, put their finger in my face and be like, Matt, I fucking hate grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> right. Like, why who, do you do this? Who, who would you ever know? say like, it? Nobody's who would ever, ever said do that? that to me. Some people are like kind of on the fence, like, eh, I love it. I hate it. Or, you know, it's just like, it's not my favorite thing, but you know, but no one has ever, like people have aversions to every type of food sure. out there. You know, you know, I don't know who it is, but I'm sure somebody out there hates pizza. Very, very small percentage. Yeah. But like sushi, you mentioned, I mean, sushi is very polarizing. Like some people love it. Some people hate it. Some people are on the fence in the middle. But grilled cheese is like nobody hates a grilled cheese sandwich. And I don't I don't hear I could be wrong. There could be a vast array of narratives about sushi experiences. And I'm sure there are in certain parts of the world. But I don't hear that even for me, like last night, making this grilled cheese literally just to feel comfort, to feel better, to feel like. You know, uh, you know, if you're, it, and it's intense. I was thinking about, and I want to ask you, um, I want to tell you mine first. Like, what's your like story about grilled cheese? I know for me, my grandmother. First of all, she was a terrible cook. Uh-huh. Uh, she's she's passed, but um, but she made an amazing grilled cheese. And her version, again, it's not a melt grilled cheese, but it is. It was the only thing she knew how to cook. 
Right. And so she took a lot of pride in that. <laughs> and so literally it was just two pieces of Italian bread, uh, butter, and then either a sharp cheddar, an American, or a white American, like one and a half slices. And then she would put it in a toaster oven. She wouldn't fry it. She, wouldn't do, she would just put it in a toaster oven. And for some reason, it was like, and she'd get one, one pickle spear. And then she would, I would be at her house. This was, this was lunch with my grandma. Oh, yeah. And she would sit there with her hands under her chin. Watching. And she'd watch me eat. And she was, first of all, I think she just had a lot of pride because she couldn't cook anything else. But she saw me enjoy that sandwich. And that, it was interesting, that represented this moment. And I think about it since she's passed you know, where we shared this experience. And it's weird because you can do that with a lot of stuff, but for some reason, and I'm not trying to like get crazy about the narrative here, for some reason it really is, the more I started thinking about it, this is, it's fucking grilled cheese, man. That's, that's the conduit mm-hmm. for, for like relationships. Do you, do you have a, a grilled cheese a, story? My story is not as good as yours, so I can, I'm going to steal yours actually. Yeah. When the next time somebody asks me, I'm going to tell them that story. Take it. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's take it. It's, it's, uh, I mean, I don't have like a specific story like yours like this one moment in time like every you know like that but i definitely remember my mother was was a really good cook my grandmother was a really good cook um she, they came from um they were um farmers from north ridgeville actually okay like third generation we owned a farm in north ridgeville 200 acres so we raised livestock when i was a kid like i spent half my my formative years in Greater Cleveland, and then I spent half my formative years out in North Ridgeville on a 200-acre farm, like raising cattle, raising chickens, farming. Wow. Like, I never ate any meat from a grocery store until I was like in 19 or 20 years old. Like I didn't even, I mean, I knew it existed, but we had all we needed from this farm. It was really an awesome upbringing. So you spent most of your most of your years out there. Uh, the well, we would go. I mean, I where are you from originally? You're from Par- Cleveland. Par- Cleveland. Parma. Okay. Yeah. So we had a, we lived in Parma, but every weekend we would go out to the farm, or in the summer times we'd spend two or three or four days out there. My parents would go on vacation, you know, every so often, and we would go stay with my grandparents and like live on the farm. But I mean, that was I, I knew nothing else. Like we would go butcher cows when I was four years old. That's we'd insane. Go That's a very interesting. Kill chickens that kind- and stuff, you know, all that kind of. Then I would come back to, to Cleveland Parma, yes, and <laughs> like- go to elementary school with all my friends and tell them that I was killing chickens and cows over the weekend and teachers were calling my parents like um, what, what's happening like, what's happening and my mom was like <laughs> no that's really happening it's okay don't worry about it so what did that do for you that 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 dichotomy it seems interesting you go from a pretty urban experience to then going right to a to that sort of rural experience uh, I mean I, I I'm very fortunate for having that upbringing because I saw both sides of it like yeah. I know where my food's coming from it it really helped me appreciate the fact it helped me appreciate family a, a ton and, and because when we would do anything on the farm, when we would like have weekends where we would butcher chickens or cows or even go out to the, you know, pick corn or do whatever, like it was a family affair. Like really? my uncles, my great uncles, like, you know, my great grandparents were alive at, when I was very young, they would come in and like, it was this big thing, you know, that would happen. So I definitely appreciated family a ton early on in my years and I, I've carried it all through, you know, through today. But it's just my appreciation for food. Yeah. Um, like my, the process it goes the through. The process it goes through from like watching something picked, taken to the kitchen, yeah. made into something, and then we consume it that day. You know, like it was weird. You know, I'm a vegetarian now, but it's weird to think that like. Are we, you really? Yeah. Okay. We would kill cattle in the morning and we would eat a steak, that steak, that day. Did that influence your, your mood to no, be a vegetarian? No. It, it freaked I me go out back when and, I was a kid, I go back man. and forth because when you see it, I mean, I didn't live on a farm, but when you see an yeah. animal. I don't know if you've ever eaten, like, fresh, like, meat. Well, because steaks are aged, as you know. Yeah. Like, you know, what, 30, 45, 75 days or whatever beyond. But a fresh steak, like, killed that morning. I've never had. Meat, no, I have not had anything that wasn't. It's very meat. gamey. It tastes like the cow smells. It's Holy really shit. weird. So, like, this is me doing this when I'm three, four, five, six years old. So, it definitely, I mean, I can still smell it and taste it, like, now talking to you. And that, that certainly did influence, like, the fact that I'm a vegetarian now. But... Um, that forced not, that that did like lead me down the path of vegetarianism. I think because okay. I was never because of all those experiences. I was never a huge meat eater when I was a kid. I mean, yeah. I did, but not because I really liked it or enjoyed it. It was just like, oh, here's what, what we eat. eat. This is what we do. And then once I started being able to have my own conscious thought, my own conscious decision making, I was like, I started gravitating more towards like non non meat items. Yeah. And then I've just I just committed like you know almost 13 years ago now so wow when you when you would go through these you talk about this family affair and i don't mean to like fetishize the farm thing but like oh, i don't care when you t- when you're like butchering chickens or you're doing that was and you, you got family members there was there like a reverence that farmers have like a reverence for this process what like 
I always think in my mind, like, when you do this, or is it, like, silent? Are people, no, are we was, talking? Is it, like, every day? Like, hey, you doing? Like and then you're, how you doing? And then you're cutting the head off. Yeah, it's like you're, it's, I mean, when you watch stuff on television, you watch, like, farms or kitchens or you watch anybody doing what they do, they always romanticize it and they always make yeah. it to, to sound like this really cool, awesome, like, engaging, awesome thing. But, yeah. like, with, when, when you actually are part of something, a kitchen or a farm life or a garbage man or whatever the hell it is. It's like, it's just, it's day to day life. It's become second nature. Do. Yeah. Like when we, like the, the farm thing, like if you want you know, referencing that, yeah, there was no like, you know, romanticizing it or like, it wasn't this big build up and we're going to do this. It was just, it just happened, you know? Yeah. I mean, people, you know, it was like people would talk. I mean, here, I'll give you the, the nutshell version of what would happen. So yeah. if we would go kill chickens, we'd go put your chickens we would have 200 chickens that day that we would do. Just They're just they're hanging alive. out. Here they are. They're alive. We raised them from chicks. Like my grandparents would get 200 Oh, God. I, get, I would get emotionally involved. Yeah. Go ahead. So Sorry. you get chicks, and you get all these chicks, and then uh, we would normally get them. I forget when we'd get them. We'd probably get them in the fall, in the spring. Yeah, we'd probably get them in the spring. We'd raise them all summer, yeah. and then we'd go in the fall. Anyways, so you get 200. You, you know, we'd watch them get raised. We'd go out and feed them and stuff with my grandparents, <sighs> and then – then they're adult chickens, you know, and they'd all be females. No, no rooster. No, were they roosters? I think they were all, I don't know. I don't remember. This is That's going a back. different story too. That's a, so anyway, so we would go in the morning, crack, ass crack of dawn. We're getting out there. Me, my grand, my grandparents, my, my mom, my dad, my uncles, oh, my shit. cousins, my, my grandparents, brothers you're and sisters. You're all getting up and you're just, we're going to Yeah, we're this. all there. So we get there early in the morning and then. My dad and my, my, my dad's job, my grandfather's job, my job, my brother's job, we were the killers when I was a kid. So my dad is not good with a, with a knife. He's not a culinary guy. So we would – it's just more graphic than we all thought we'd this get is, into no, this today. No, awesome. this is fantastic. No, I'm serious. This is like what okay. I, I, I'm fascinated so, about. This. So w- what we did is – and I don't want the people who are going to think I'm like some chicken killer out there. Like, oh I don't my, think- we're, we're boycotting melt. This kills <laughs> animals. No. Anyway, so, so this is, this is non, this is, this is very family farm. This is, this is not some big factory farm. I right. Mean, we, we, everything that we did on the farm was to sustain our family. We didn't yes. sell meat off. We, we all the, the crops that were raised, like we did soybean and sweet corn and stuff okay. like that was a, those were for profit, but all the, the food that the animals were raised basically to feed the family yeah. for the next year. Like we had chicken on our, on our freezers and there were mountains of freezers at the farm where we would just keep like chickens and meats and all this kind of stuff. And we would just pick off of it all year until we were, you know, then we were out and you go mm-hmm. replenish it next year. So anyways, going back to my killing chicken story. Yeah. So we would have these. So the chickens are all in this big barnyard right here. Your dad wasn't a good. My dad good was, with a was knife. not good with a knife. So he was designated as the killer. So my dad and my grandfather were the killers. So in the very morning, me and my brother go th- into the into the barn and with my dad and my uncle and my, my grandfather. And we'd have these really long, probably about 12 foot long poles with a hook on the end. And you go out and you hook a chicken and you reel them in like you're fishing. And you take them, you grab them by their two legs, and there's four troughs, four troughs that are big, like big cones basically. So yeah. big on the top, and it comes down small on the bottom. Chickens go in upside down. You reach in, you grab their head, you cut off, you cut the head off. You can stick the knife straight through and you cut it either left or right. And it cuts really quick. Really quick. They don't yeah. know anything. They bleed out. They, they, they lay there, they bleed out, they're dead. You go back in, you take them. So my brother and I are carrying dead chickens. How old are you at this time? Uh, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> Holy shit. So we're carrying dead chickens down the, the barn corridor to the next person in line. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. We take them to a big vat of boiling water. Okay. So then next, the chickens go into a big vat of boiling water. And briefly, because you're not cooking them. Right. But what that does is it loosens the feathers. Okay. So, so you're dropping them in, you're heating up the exterior of the chicken really quick, and then you take them out. So these uh, now I'm holding boiling hot chicken yes. that are smoking So and smell like, you know, like I just boiled a barnyard animal. Yes. So I'm walking back down the corridor from the boiling water to a table, which is about this size, yeah. a table, and you lay the, now the dead, boiling, dripping hot water chicken on there. And then it's hard to describe, but imagine... Imagine a big, uh, uh, you know, when you see uh, they're laying um, a new road. So, mm-hmm. you know, they're, those big, um, what the hell are they called? 
I'm drawing a blank. Oh my god, I can't. What, draw. what color are they? No, it's it? a big machine. That, that, oh, that, it rolls a thing. Yeah, the roller. Yeah, the roll. What, what, the, are, the, what are those it's things called? It's the rolling thing. What are those things? Steam roll. So it's a steam roll. Yeah, you're pushing. Okay, so essentially. There's one of those big wheels that's on from a steamroller, but it's on this machine. Okay. Okay. And and the the the, the roll has these like about as long as my finger. Okay. It's got a bunch of uh, big hard rubber fingers on this roller, okay. and then it, it's rolling around like this. So it's rolling away from you. So it's coming up and rolling back. Okay. So what you do is you take these chickens, and the wheel is running. You would hold them by their legs and throw them on top of this wheel. And what the wheel does is plucks all the feathers out That's of the intense. chickens. So you're holding this so you're holding this chicken on here and it's going like this and it's moving around and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And you're flipping it over. It's moving? No, it's dead. Oh okay. No, but it's it's moving yeah, yeah, because yeah. Okay, the fingers okay. Sorry, yeah. are are through it. And what's happening is the wet hot feathers are being oh, being man. ripped off of this chicken and okay. thrown up against the back of this whatever is catching the feathers. And the goal is to get as many feathers off as possible. And now I have two chickens in my hand that have no feathers. And then I take them down again back to the room where the boiling water is. And that's also the butchering room where you take, there's an open, there's an, now next to the pot of boiling water, there's an boil, open flame. And you take the chicken and you have to sear off all the rest of the hairs that didn't come off. Yeah. Or you pluck them off with a pair of pliers. But some little feathers don't come off. There's like little hairs and stuff. So you try to get as many off as you can. And then you drop it off to my mom or my grandmother or my, my aunt or my and uncle. That's the next phase. And then they actually butcher the, the animal. They butcher the chicken. So now you have a dead, skin, you know, featherless chicken that's laying there with its, with its feet on and its head still attached. And then they take it from there. This is literally farm to table, and I know exactly why you're a vegetarian. What do you think our society would be like if more people had that rural farming experience? Do you think we'd be more connected? More. Oh, I think people would appreciate the things that I appreciate a little bit more. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's you know, you could take, you could go back 50, 60, 70 years when that was kind of like n- normal, a little bit more normal, but you still, I mean, you could trace history back in Cleveland and you could go back how many generations and there's tons of people that didn't have that type of, but yeah. there's tons of people that have probably different upbringings than I did that appreciate this, the same type of thing that I do yeah. or appreciate something completely different. When did you get into music? Uh, very, really early on, I, I was, I, I found music like rock and rolly type stuff. My what, parents what was were, the band. What was the band that uh, did it for you? Well, Kiss, obviously. You yeah. know, that was the band that I discovered when I was very young, and that's why they're, I'm still a big super Is fan Ace of them Freely, today. Your, I, I was, st- I was talking to you on on Facebook because I was going to do a friend request. Oh right. And uh, not that you, I'm sure you'd only get a couple of those. Uh, everyone wants to get sandwiches and stuff but I was but I looked and I saw you had like your profile chains like Ace Freely like seven times I have like I gotta, <laughs> I gotta ask you about Ace Freely is that the, is that he your... was uh, yeah I, he was always my favorite character in Kiss yeah why Why is that why he's I thought he was a pretty serious guy like he always seemed like oh no, the... lord no really yeah he's always drunk that's why <laughs> He was the guy that's, that, is that was why always, he seemed so intense. Yeah, he okay. was always drunk, or he's always being held up by another guy in the band, or whatever. Yeah, really, he was I had the no drunk idea. and drug addict. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He was always the most charismatic, had the big, the best personality. He was not the businessman of the band. He wrote a lot of the songs. He was a really good music. I always felt like good. Kiss always gets shit because of their their musicianship not being. I mean, I'm sh- right yeah. that the showmanship is there, but the musicianship isn't. I always thought he was a really good musician. He is. He's, really. a, he's a very good guitar player. He influenced a ton of people. It's very hard to find a band that's popular today that that, can't, that doesn't say Kiss was somehow in, they were somehow influenced by them. Yeah, you know, especially bands from the '80s and the '90s. Like they, you know, that Kiss was like their bread and butter. You know, when we were kids, like that's what you grew up listening to. Uh, I mean, so my you... parents were Beatles and Stones fans. Okay. Uh, mostly more Beatles and Stones. So I had those albums a couple select albums when i was a kid that i would i would put on a, a little kitty turntable that i had as a kid and you know i always thought that was really cool to like listen to like rubber soul when i was a kid and you know i had no idea what was even happening but the music kind of resonated with me yeah and then um my mom was a school teacher so her big thing was like reading write, writing arithmetic all that kind of stuff uh, my parents are not musicians. They they listen to music on the radio, but it wasn't like a big thing. My dad yeah. was kind of is is still into like a lot of fifties and sixties, like soul, big band, rock, that kind of stuff. But so why it, Kiss for you? Why was that like? Uh, a- because that was just the next generation. Because when I was a kid, I was getting back to the my mom being a, a elementary school teacher. Yeah, her big thing was we went to the library every week. We went to the That's Kyle, the Cuyahoga County Public Library, Parma Branch. At Snow Road and Broadview. Okay, they should tweet out this episode. They should. Good shout out. And um, 
my mom, I wanted to get records. That's all I wanted to do was get records from the library. But my mom said, okay, you, here's the deal. You have to get one book and you have to read your book. And if you read your book, we will go back to the library. You can get a record and nice. you have to get another book. And if you read that book, we, we'll take it back and get you another record. So that was my deal. So I would do it. I would get a book, probably never read it, but <laughs> I would get a record and I would listen to that record backwards and forwards, upsides and downsides. And at that time, the Cuyahoga County Public Library did not have any sort of filter with the record albums that they had. So I would sneak over to the young adult section and pick out a record. And there was Black Sabbath. There was ACDC. There was, there was Alice Cooper. There was Kiss. Yeah. There was any of the 70s rock bands that you can think of or early 80s rock bands were in this collection. So I would just pick out the coolest cover that I saw, yeah. and I would take it home, and I would listen to it. And fortunately for me, my parents never never you know filtered what i was doing or listening to because if they would they if they would have like listened to the 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 records or the lyrics or whatever they probably would not have let me listen to these albums when i was six or seven years old but thank god they did because you know that's how i got into music that's how i discovered all these bands that's why all these bands are still my favorite bands nowadays because i just stumbled upon them when i was that young and there was a neighborhood family friend who lived across street from us when we were growing up and he's probably six years older than i am and we, whenever I, we went over to their house to visit, hang out, my parents would always throw me in his bedroom, like, oh, go hang out with Mike, you know? And then he was six years older than me, so he didn't want to hang out with me. So he would just be like, hey, go through my record collection, whatever you want, just go put on and go listen to. And he had all the Kiss records. So, so you're listening to, like, Strutter. Yeah, like- so I'm finding all these Kiss <laughs> records. And he eventually gr- graduated from listening to Kiss. So he, one day I went over, and he's like, you know what? Instead of you listening to these here, why don't you take these home with you? So he actually gave me a couple oh, of Kiss awesome. records. I took them home and done. The rest is history. Yeah, but then you get you put this like rock and roll imprint from that experience on this on this enterprise. How did yeah. how did that transit? Was it because you were working in kitchens and then like that story mm-hmm. you were telling? And then, it just all came together. Like Melt is a culmination of every single thing that I've done. Isn't that cool? In my life, honestly, it is. It's like, and the real reason that Melt is, exists. And not the real reason, but a lot of the reason it exists is because at some point in my early 20s or, or 30s, or, you know, it must have been early, late, early to late 20s, like, I was starting to get kind of nostalgic about being a kid and, like, all this kind of stuff. And I just wondered what it would be like if you could be seven years old for the rest of your life. Like, that would be the ideal situation. It would be the be greatest seven. ever. Because you have no issues. You have no problems. Depending on your upbringing. But yeah, yes, you don't worry about the, like, world problems or whatever, you know. You're, you're not supposed to, let's say you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. You know, if you're the ideal seven year old. So when I created Melt, I wanted to create the ultimate like restaurant utopia. I wanted to create a, a place where people could come, forget about the outside world for 25 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, or two hours, or three hours, have a great grilled cheese sandwich, which would bring back awesome childhood memories. Yeah. Watch random things on the television like Cartoon Network, VH1 Classic. Um, I created a playlist that, 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 really summarizes like all the genres of rock and roll and popular music starting in the fifties up to present day. Um, the photographs, the black and white photographs or anything on the walls, yeah. like are supposed to be memory, tri- memory triggers. Like the original location in Lakewood was obviously very Lakewood and Cleveland centric, but as we've ex- expanded out, we've kind of become more of an Ohio brand. Mm-hmm. So depending on where the location is located, we, we hyper-focus on that. Like the Akron location is very Akron centric. Dayton's very Akron centric, Canton, Columbus, those type of things. But I wanted to just fill the place with as many like memory triggers, sight and sound overload, like sensory overload. Like when you walk into melt, like I want you to be, have like blinders on and only focus on where you're at, what you're doing at that time of day. Like don't think about, I have to go here later on, or I've got this problem at home, or it's a friggin' snowstorm outside, yeah. or the president I hate or I love, or it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, like the here and now. And that's really why I wanted to create Melt. And that's why Grilled Cheese made sense. And this is all after the fact. I never thought about this. This wasn't like some brainchild when I was like, oh, my God, like all these things are going to work. You know, like Melt wasn't even supposed to work in the first place. And so that's interesting because it seems like in retrospect, it'd be easy to take credit and be like, yes, I formulated this plan to trigger the nostalgic Dude, memories I, of all the. No, I had no fucking idea. I was trying to create a place that I thought was really cool. It's a place that I wanted to hang out in, honestly, because I knew that if I opened my own restaurant, I knew I know the person I am, the work ethic I have, yeah. that I was literally going to work there for the rest of my life. You That's know? probably why it worked, though, right? Because there's an honesty in that. Like when you just I, do I think you, so. when yeah. you just do you, and you're just like, this so, is my love, this yeah, is my passion. Yeah, so I, I had a menu that I loved that I could probably eat for the rest of my life. I yeah. had a beer list that I loved that I could drink for the rest of my life. 
I had a cool eclectic place that I had set up that yeah. was very cool in a century old building in Lakewood. I hired all my friends to work for me. So I had 12 people working for me that I loved and I wanted to hang out with all the time. And I just hoped that 12 or 14 other people like saw it and wanted to hang out there too. So it was not planned. I mean, at all, it wasn't supposed to turn into like this big thing or we're going to expand 10 different times or we're going to become this like, you know, this Cleveland institution. And why did it go that direction? I mean, was it just because you see, you see the effect it has on people? It's, is yeah. it something you control or are you just kind of like, holy shit, it's just because I remember this was one of the first places that at least in Cleveland and I, I, I never had like a fine dining experience as a kid. Like, you know, I know that there are some places in New York where, when I live there and even in Cleveland where people wait for a long time. Right. Melt was the first place, the Lakewood location where I was like, I waited for two and a half hours. Yeah, bro. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, and people did that. People. Yeah. People did that. And yeah, still we do. still have decent amount of waits, too, even though we've expanded to 10 locations now. Yeah. But yeah. Um. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, I could have I could have stopped it after one if I really wanted to. But yeah. we expanded the first location three times or twice, actually. So we opened in 2006. We put a patio in in 2007. Um, and then we expanded to the second storefront mm -hmm. in 2008. And then we were at all four walls in Lakewood. We were still very busy, very popular. Um, and then an opportunity came to open up in Cleveland Heights in 2010. And I just had a conversation with myself and a couple other people. And I said, well, what are we going to do? Yeah. You know, it's like, well, we could stay here and do this for the rest of our lives or we can go off and ride this wave and see what happens. And then, you know, so we made the conscious decision to try to expand to the second location, not thinking about the third or fourth or fifth, but say everything that we've done and I've done up to this point with Melt has been very organic. And I'm very proud of that. And I'm very, yeah. very happy that nothing feels forced. Nothing feels like we have to do it. We do it if we want to. Um, and that's really why we started expanding. I mean, I could, I could pull the trigger right now. I could say, you know what? Ten locations, we're done. We're going to ride this out. We're going to see what happens. But, you know, we're still looking to expand the brand because it stopped being my brand and my restaurant many, many years ago because there's been so many people on the way that have helped mm -hmm. us to achieve what we are today, have really molded us and shaped us into, into what we are today. It's, some of it is some of my regional manager, managers that have been with us for 10 years plus, mm -hmm. you know, I've got some people that started day one with me in Lakewood. It still work for me today in my upper management team. Some of the ideas that we do is some sandwiches or some like off the wall idea we had came from a dishwasher, came from a host, came oh, sure. from somebody in the outside world, you know? So everybody that's been involved with melt over the years has put their two cents on it somehow, some way. So I, I continue to do what I do obviously for myself for my family, mm -hmm. but I do it for my staff, for my people, what we call the melt family, you know, they're, they're our life, you know, like they're the, they're the, they're the reason that I still get up in the morning and do what, do what I do. It's not because I want to go to work and do what I do. You know, I do it because this is, this is important to a lot more people than just me. How do you treat people like family? How do you treat them with equity and fairness? Because the pressures of doing it right, the pressures of getting it done or getting the, the best quote, Sometimes I know for me, I struggle with it all the time. Like, I don't want to sound like a dick, like come over here, get over here. We need to do this and like take right. people for granted. How do you manage that? It's, it's difficult because my personality is very friendly and my personality is very forgiving. And I'm, I'm honestly not the best restaurant manager that I've ever known because well, I guess you need to be like tougher. Do you think is that the, well, because I had, there's, there's, there's just different ways to manage people and there's different ways to get things done. I'm the yeah. guy that will give the employee like 500 chances to do it right or oh well you screwed up six different times but it's okay let me give you a seven because i like you you know i'm that yeah. guy where i've got other managers that make those decisions for me that aren't as nice as i am you know they're yeah. you know it's like the, the the fame the goods cop bad cop kind of thing i'm the good cop in any situation where yeah. you know where there's i have other people people so i mean i struggle with that every day with my staff with my guests with with food quality with service levels i mean it's it's tough i mean we have 10 open and operating restaurants that are open right now. And I'm sitting here talking to you and I'm not yeah. in any of them. I mean, we're in one, but I'm not involved in I'm operations. I'm personally responsible for the destruction of one of them right, right. now. Well, I will hold you accountable for that. <laughs> Please do. That was difficult. I took myself and I, I had to force myself out of day-to-day -day operations many, many years ago, yeah. not many years ago, but because I just, there were so many other things I needed to accomplish as an owner for, of the company that I couldn't be the guy that was in the back cooking the food or running the food or serving the tables or washing dishes or yeah. I, can't, I can't do both things, you know? So I had to stop 
and wean myself off of that. And so now I'm, I'm the owner, you know, I, I still will go in and run food and wash dishes. I do whatever I have right. to do, but I'm not physically responsible for doing that, that, that type stuff, which, which, you, which, which has made my life a, a tremendously easier, but it also pulls me away from day to day operations. So I have to trust my staff. I have to trust my managers. I have to trust my regional team. I have to trust the process. I have to trust the operations, the policies, procedures, rules, everything we have in place. I have to trust all that. Was stuff. that a hard thing to do uh, when you when, yeah, when yeah. you wish, when you initially make that transition from a um, a smaller operation where you have your hand in the pot? Yep. Was, was that very, hard for you? Very difficult. Yeah, because it melts my baby. I mean, yeah. it's, it's mine, and it will always be mine, no matter how many people are involved. So it's I created it. It can go any direction that I, we want it to go. But yeah, it's very difficult. Once I did it, I, I mean, I'm a very trusting person too. So I ha I've always been fortunate enough to have really good people working for me. And a, a piece of advice that was given to me years ago, that which, which I have, which holds true is like always hire people and work with people that are better and smarter than you. Surround yourself with people that are yeah, so better and smarter. Yeah. I see that. Yeah. Yeah, these people are way better looking and Absolutely. smarter than you. That, and you know that from first glance. Oh, yeah. I saw when I walked, you walked in the front door. Yeah, I know. You're like, who's this guy? I'm, okay. Who's this slob with these other gorgeous people? <laughs> Carrying this blue bin That's with right. audio equipment. Yeah. So I, I've been fortunate to find people and people have found me that are better at doing several things in the restaurant than I am. I'm very good at certain things and I have surrounded myself with other people that are very good at other things. And I trust them. I, I give them carte blanche to do whatever they want to. It's like, look, I pay you to do this. Yeah. Like, I don't care how it gets done. Just do it. Now, granted, if it's going to affect the brand, if it's going to affect me personally, if yeah. it's going to make any part of what we do look bad. But we all relatively have the same mindset. So I know things are getting accomplished on a daily basis that aren't necessarily done exactly the way that I would have done them. Yeah. Like, I would, maybe I wouldn't have handled that situation exactly the same way you did. But you know what? The end result is how we wanted it done. So whatever. Just, just get it done. You know, and I'll, I'll jump in and out of certain things. But... I can't, it's very difficult for me to walk into a melt location right now, jump on the line and cook all of our food because I honestly don't know how to do it. Hmm. I mean, I could if I had to, yeah. but they, they do it way better than I do. You know, our regional managers do it way better than I do. Yeah. So I just let them do what they do. They let me do what I do. I let them do what they do. You know, everyone's paid well. We're a successful company. You know, it's a big melt love fest. So, you know, it's like, I don't want to. Don't disrupt it unless you have to. You know, yeah. why change it if it's not broken sort of Where thing. Where did that whole, uh, the whole being nice thing come from? Is that your parents? You yeah, think? my parents are very nice people. Um, I've just always had that mindset. I don't know why. Like, I, I don't want to be a dick. I've worked for enough people in my life that have been, like, the assholes. Yeah, you know that experience. That I just don't want to be that. It's the like, worst. I took, I took more from managers and owners that I worked for. I took more of what I don't want to do than what I do want to do. Mm. I saw a lot of people like, I don't want to, I never want to treat people like that. Or I never want to yeah. act like that. Or I never want to be that guy that does that. Or I never want to like, you know, so I, I've just, that's really held, held true throughout my entire career is like, I try to treat people like equals. Like, would I want to be talked to like that? No. So I'm not going to talk to somebody else like that. Yeah. Like, or I've never asked somebody to do anything that I've never physically done before. Mm. Like I've washed dishes several times. I've cleaned fryers. I've cleaned up shit from toilets. I, you know, people shit on the floor or do whatever. I've done that. Jesus. I carried chickens down the hallway. I would never, you know, yeah. I was like, I would never ask somebody to do anything I've never done before right. in a restaurant setting, obviously. That's like that. It's, it's kind of like that farmer mentality in a sense. Cause like when you get your hands dirty and you're in that process, you kind of understand, you have a respect for a process. So it's like unless you can get your hands on it, unless you right. experience it yourself doing it, it's hard to ask. It feels really authorita uh, authoritarian or even like kind of bourgeois to kind of just be like, well, I, I know that this can be done in theory. Mm -hmm. and I think there's more respect for a, a founder or an owner um, who has that approach. Yeah. I know that as, as when you work for people and, and, and when you know that the person that is leading you or that is at least um, founded the environment that you're working, if you know that they – live that life too you know i think the same thing is why people get so pissed off about politics right is because so many whether it's right or left or in the middle is that they talk a particular way but what they're talking about doesn't necessarily resonate with the everyday lives of the people living them and it feels almost that they're so removed from them right even if they once lived those lives that they don't they don't connect so i can see why that approach works i mean it seems like when i it could be a total illusion but it seems like the employee when i go and i've gone to melt for years employees seem pretty 
relaxed, pretty happy. They got, what's the tattoo? Th- is that a, is that just a rock and roll thing? Or was that like a, what I want mean? everyone to wear, like have tattoos? Because oh, I no, thought it was, was so cool. I was like, everyone here, man, no other place would let you work. That's pretty much the way it was. I mean, like when we opened up 10 years ago, 12 years ago now, the restaurant world was completely different than it is now. Yeah. It was a lot more conservative. Like you didn't want your guests to see tattoos. Like we, we became like the island for misfit toys, like very, very that. quick. Where... Like I had tattoos, and I didn't. I didn't care if you were tattooed, pierced, what color hair you had, how you wore your hair. I mean, we didn't have have like a really strict melt dress code for our employees back when we first opened up, because I care about your personality. I don't. I can't teach people to be nice people. I can't teach you to smile. I can't teach you, you know, to say please and thank you and yeah. be cordial and those kind of things. I, that's impossible. That was your parents' job, or that was whoever huh. that influenced yeah. you. That was their job. I can't bring people in and train them how to be a nice person. But I can train you how to serve it, serve, host, bartend. I can train you to be a line cook, a, a, to wash dishes, or do whatever. So we hire a personality first and how you look second. And yeah. just it just worked out that we started such a small restaurant group that we were able to be not selected with who we hired, but we didn't need to really hire a lot of people up front because we were busy. I hired all my friends. They just happened to be tattooed and pierced yeah. and whatever. And that's just the way Melt kind of became this like counterculture type restaurant. And We've just taken it into our adult years. You know, as we've expanded, we've kind of tried to carry it on. And, you know, there's a lot of restaurant groups out there that are becoming a lot more lax with their grooming standards. But when we first opened up, we were like literally one of the only places in Cleveland that you could work and have a tattoo that was shown. Corporate restaurants, there's no way you could go to an Applebee's or a Friday's or, yeah, you have to close, you have to to cover it up. I mean, even last year, we opened up at Cedar Point inside the park at Cedar Point last year. And Cedar Point had a very strict grooming standard that you could not work at Cedar Point and have a tattoo that was showing. You had to somehow, some way cover it up. So you got kids walking around Cedar Point with like a big armband on covering right. up a tattoo that's right here. Like that looks worse than a friggin' tattoo. Right. It's stupid. So this year they actually loosened up their grooming standards so you can actually show tattoos and work at Cedar Point. But I mean, that just shows you how far it's come that a big company like Cedar Fair that owns 14 different amusement parks around the company is probably a multi-billion dollar industry is like allowing every single one of their employees to have tattoos to show. Obviously, they're probably not allowing anything that's like offensive or whatever. They're going to probably pick and choose. But in general, but yeah, going back, I mean, there was not a conscious effort like, hey, we're going to become this restaurant that that everybody's just allowed. I just, it, to me, it was, all, yeah, it was just second nature to me. I always had tattoos. I was always around people in like the punk rock, rock and roll world that had long hair, short hair, shaved head, tattoos, piercings, colors, you know, whatever. So it, it, it seems to open up the demographic though. I mean, it seems like oh, you have all, all kinds of people waiting two hours. And I say that now only cause that's my memory. The food was amazing, but I remember also just willingly doing it too, by the way. Right. Not like, I'm not like people listen, like, I'm not going there. I don't want to wait for two hours. Literally, I would do that constantly. Yeah. I'd I, wait for, but, but it was also like you would see the, the clientele as well or, or the customer comes in. It's, it's a wide range. Of yeah, folks. we have a very diverse How do you uh, track that stuff? Demographic. Like, the, like how do you? you we just don't. Kind of just we don't waste like, time doing it. Just, yeah. It's like, what well, it goes back to your question about why is grilled cheese so like nostalgic or why does it resonate with every single person on earth? Yeah. Well, that's why our demographic is so spread out and so wide. Like universal. we attract so many different people because everybody can relate to what we're doing. What brings you joy? Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 got, I got remarried a couple years ago. Uh, my wife and I have a really awesome relationship. So just going home and seeing her, we have two dogs. Um, we moved to a new house last year. So we're kind of working on that now. I love that. My, my family still gives me joy. I don't see him as much as I should, mm. but my wife is a really important person in my life, so uh, that gives me joy. I mean, melt. I still love what I do. I still do it, but yeah. I don't like. Unfortunately, I don't smile on a daily basis. I'm like, oh man, melt's so great. I just ev- I love everything about How what comes I just do. How come the workload and everything that goes yeah, into it? Yeah, there's a lot of pressure, you know, and I put a lot of undue pressure on myself. I could I could probably like you know cash out, not cash out, but I could probably check out and be like, hey, you guys got this. I'm gonna go. You know, I'm going to go, I'm going to take a break for a couple of weeks and just sit around yeah. my house and do nothing. But, but I'm a very driven person and that's what I choose to do. I work six to seven days a week. You know, yeah. I mean, if I work a 10 hour day, that's a short day for me. It's like weird. Like, it's like, oh, it's seven o'clock and I'm done. Like, yeah. well, this is weird. Like I should be working till midnight. Like this is odd. Um, is that a lot work of ethic, that work ethic come joy. from when you were, when you were a kid, you think? That uh, work ethic? Yeah. But that's just always, I've, I've always been. Like I said, I've always been an entrepreneurial type person. I've mm-hmm. always been a very driven person. I've always been doing two or three things in my life at the same time. 
I don't want to sit down. I don't want to rest. You That's know. just in your DNA. Yeah. I don't know where it came from. Okay. It wasn't particularly like my mom did it or my dad did it or my grandparents did it. It's just like that's that's how I just chose to live my life. I yeah. didn't want to – I'm the type of guy – I don't want to have any regrets. I don't want to look back on my deathbed and be like, man, I wish I would have done that or I wish I would have done this or I wish I would have done this. Like, yeah. I would rather just do it now, get it over with, and then, you know, I want – that's why I opened my own restaurant. If I if I succeeded, killer. If I failed, at least I knew I at least tried you did it. it. At least I you could tried move it. on, yeah. pick up the pieces. The sun's gonna rise tomorrow, and then I'll try something else. And I'll regret do something is the else. worst. I hate. I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to do that. You know, yeah. like if I regret, I'll be like, oh, I, sh- I regret like not saying goodbye to my friend when he left. But I'll see him in two weeks. You know, it's like right. if I have those regrets, so, yeah, so be it. But I don't want to have major regrets. Like if my goal in life was to climb some like you know, major mountain peak, then do it. Then do it. You yeah. know, if I want to go travel the world then go do it, you know, my goal was to open up a restaurant and I did it. You know, my goal was to play in a touring band and put records out. And, and I did that, you know, so I got all the things out of my system that when I was a little kid and I was like, Oh my God, when I'm a big adult, I want to do these things. And yeah. fortunately I was able to, to accomplish two of my major goals in life. So now it's like, I'm just, I'm just hanging out waiting to die, man. What? I'm bored. No, well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, my, my goal was to have an interesting conversation with you, and I, I appreciate your time. I think, I think we did it. I and think so. Yeah. I think it was good. You want a hug now or what? Let's do it. All right, let's do it.